have Stuart Smith with Booting Faster. Oh. Right, thank you. Um, so I'm Stuart, I work at IBM. Uh, I just thought of a good way to describe my job, and that is to bring the F word more into open source communities, and that F word is firmware. Uh, so I work on open power firmware, uh, primarily Opal, uh, and you should all have open source firmware stacks. And I'm gonna talk about how we're trying to make machines boot faster. So one wise person once said, premature optimization is the root of all evil. And when you combine this with the idea of trying to bring a new machine up or a new processor up, and you realize that booting is a feature, you might think you might try and first make the machine boot at all before you make it boot quickly. And that's definitely what we do with our hardware. And I had this thought process coming into this talk of hang, going, huh, what's the fastest booting machine I've ever used? And it looks something like this. <laughs> right, it's like you press the power button before you're on the power switch, onto the keyboard, everything was up and running and you could go for your life. Uh, it was really quick. Processor starts executing instructions at an offset, straight from ROM, go. Processor work. And this is a little bit slower because we're doing all this I.O. Right? You hear the whir of the disk drive, and that just brings back memories, doesn't it? Um, or for the young kids, we had this thing, yeah. Um, <laughs> and Apple II is slower, but you know, we're reading things from disk. So this is kind of involving a lot of I.O. and arguably an OS and everything there. And there's probably a difference between sort of firmware and an operating system, not what there really was. But once we actually got things that were an OS, things still took longer because they were doing more things. Uh, and one thing I started thinking about, what users care about is total boot time, right? So if you look at, you know, a PC or something there, you might get all this time through BIOS and then it finally gets up to starting a, an operating system. A user doesn't care whether the OS only takes a second or not, they care about the total time. You care about when you can get to the point <laughs> of getting to a login prompt or whatever your workload is. Uh, so this talk is gonna work backwards from here. So I figured let's go from the time your computer is ready to do something useful, let's go right the back to the point where you know, the power cable goes in and you press the button. Uh, when you're here, you've got user space, other luxurious, strange lands where you have things like memory protection and prompts and graphical things. Uh, and it looks somewhere like this, right? We have user space, that's your real workload. Before that, we have to start an OS kernel. Before that, we have to start some kind of bootloader that's going to work out where you load an operating system from, and there's going to be some firmware. Uh, and really, before that, you have another thing. If you've got a server kind of hardware, you've got a service processor, you've got a BMC, and that is the thing that lets you turn on your computer. So it's the small computer inside your computer that allows you to turn on your computer, or rather, turns on the smaller computer that's inside your processor that turns on the other computer to make it look like a computer. Um, it is turtles all the way down. Uh, so for all of our machines, our open power machines, they all have a service processor. And I'm not gonna talk about the service processor, right? Let's just assume it's already running. And if we looked at you know, an OS boot process of like what's the whole path of doing that, and this is just running in a VM in my laptop with, you know, obviously it was loaded because I had a web browser open and that uses all your memory. So uh, the OS boot to user space is really quick. Like booting to a graphical environment is like really, really quick. And even when we run it on you know, our machine, so this is booting on a, on a power server, just booting Ubuntu, like lots of things are done in parallel. We have wonderful programs now that have dependencies and work out what to start in what order and what you can do in parallel and boot things really quick. You get to user space and a prompt and cite your services really quick. So I'm, I'd like it to be faster, but it's pretty quick already. And if we look at the total boot time, we start to see things a bit differently. So this is a Power 8 machine booting, and you might already tell that you know, this doesn't look like Linux booting, because it's not, this is firmware. And you can probably work out this is taking a decent amount of time. Probably longer than it took that Fedora system to boot, and longer than that Ubuntu system to boot. And remember what I was saying about total boot time. Like, we don't care as a user that it's the operating system's fault or it's the firmware's fault. We care about things just in total being quicker. And, you know, things didn't necessarily get better when we switched to Power 9. So that was a Power 8 system, this is Power 9. Uh, we get you know, a little bit of early printout coming out after BMC decides to kick off the process of booting the machine in a few seconds in a video. But uh, we do get a lot of time spent just going through firmware. 
So where were we? So Power 9 systems that have been out for a little while now, about a year or so, uh, is not the first system we've shipped with this, with this firmware stack. And I thought, let's go back and look at sort of what was our original open power-ish system. How long did that take to boot? And it was this. So this is sort of an enterprise IBM box, but shipping with a firmware stack like you'd get in an open power system. And it has this lovely uh, web UI where you can do things like click the button that says, please power on my system. Uh, and you have, for status, what you have is you've got nothing coming out on the IPMI serial console uh, at all. And you've got this little web thing here that gives you very limited status to what's going on. And if you can work out what those hex codes mean and remember what they mean, then you're a better person than I am because I just Google them. Uh, and that's the feedback you get for your machine booting. And it took a long time. Uh, in fact, the only thing we ever see as output sort of before that happens is sort of petty boot loading and Linux uh, before we get to an OS. And this is part of an interesting thing because a quirk of our systems is that we, before we load an operating system, we start an operating system. So if you're going to design a system of how would you read a Linux file system to find a kernel on it and then start that kernel and parse a whole bunch of file system data structures and like a config file, what would you think would be a good environment to write that in? Fourth, yeah, there's always one. <laughs> Single person in the entire world who wants to write it in fourth. Um, <laughs> turns out no one wants to do that. You go, oh, I'd love to write it in user space, right? Wouldn't you love to write all this code in user space? We have like memory protection and like good debug tools and all of that. And hey, didn't someone already write code to parse all those file systems? Isn't that called Linux? Like, why don't we just start a Linux kernel? And then how do we hand off to another OS? Oh, okay, exec. That's literally what it's for. So we start a small embedded Linux environment out of firmware, out of Flash, that has a very small amount of user space that gives you a, you know, n-curses UI, and it will read file systems because we just use the file system code. And if that doesn't work properly, well, we could just fix the kernel and it's fixed to everyone. That sounds good. Let's contribute upstream, maybe. Uh, and we could also have an idea that we could bend things towards being better for everyone, not just our firmware stack. It also means that everyone else gets to maintain it for us. So thank you for maintaining large chunks of our firmware. Right? It's very cheap to, to hire people when they're doing it for you for other companies. Uh, and we don't have to rewrite drivers, right? We have to write drivers for an operating system anyway to make them work, and we don't have to rewrite them in firmware and forth. We can just write them once and in the kernel and tell vendors, get your driver upstream. And that's our strategy. You want to have a device that boots on our systems? We tell OEMs, get your driver upstream. And it turns out that works like really easily, and isn't that like a nice change in the world? So we, we're not stream kernels. So when we start Linux here, this Linux environment, there are improvements that to be made. So back in that very first machine we released, you might notice this is actually a pretty slow Linux boot, right? People have seen Linux boot really quickly before, and we got something going, and it took around 40 odd seconds to boot the kernel and present the menu with what you could boot with all the options available, right? Here's boot off a network, boot off a disk, and, and all of that jazz. So it took a pretty long while to boot a, uh, a Linux system. So how do, we, how do we deal with that? Well, there's already been a whole bunch of Linux distros which have done a lot of tricks to make Linux boot faster. So we should copy all of their work first, right? Before we go and tackle the rest of firmware, this is a solved problem that people have been working on for years. So we do that. So, our first efforts were going, well, we could make all the drivers modules, right? Instead of building everything in the kernel, we could do it all as modules. And that means we could probably get to user space quicker instead of waiting for all the hardware to init. Then we could start that up in parallel. And then we could start, you know, as disks appear and scanning RAID arrays, we could start parsing them. And it would be a lot quicker. And it's like, yeah, it turns out we can do that. And we've gotten that Linux thing from about 40 odd seconds to now about seven which is a nice improvement. So we've cut 35 odd seconds off of boot time. Um, but one strange thing here is that you'll notice the disks haven't shown up yet to give you an option to boot. Uh, and it took you an extra 30 seconds once you're at the menu to work out you could actually boot something. So you could go and configure your network, drop to a shell, and, and do all that, but you couldn't yet boot an OS. Uh, so what do we do there? Well, what do we get faster hardware? Turns out uh, enterprise rate adapters can take a long time to start up. What if we used? different RAID adapters or poked the teams that made those RAID adapters to make them detect disks faster. So if we grab the different machine, 
with a different thing, maybe like a normal NVMe drive or some cheap SATA card, uh, what does that mean? Well, it turns out that halved boot time, right? We could cut tens of seconds off boot time just by having a simpler way to find disks. So for the machines with the big enterprise RAID cards, that turns out to add just 30 seconds to boot time to be out of board to discover disks. And yeah, quick, right? Halved time, brilliant, job done, right? Uh, and we combine these, right? We combine all these tricks. Uh, and one crazy trick was uh, we added the quiet option to the kernel. And it turns out many IPMI implementations are less than ideal. And they can spend an awful long time trying to emulate a serial port. And we added quiet option. And on some machines that cut 18 seconds off boot time. So, uh, yeah, um, <laughs> that was a bit, what the, nice side quest. But here we can get really quickly Linux kernel up on a big machine, like, you know, dual socket, 22 cores per socket, four threads per core, a uh, whole bunch of memory. We can get Linux up, user space up, running really quick. So quiet kernel, many seconds of boot saved, and we solved this by re-implementing the BMC as an open source BMC called OpenBMC, and you should definitely run that on your hardware instead. So this is great. We saved a whole bunch of time, you know, about 40 seconds to about seven or nine seconds. Uh, not only that, it feels quicker because we start up the UI first before we've detected everything. It's like, oh, it's kind of ready. You notice how you get a desktop environment up and the disk is still going and things are still starting because you don't need everything up first. So we kind of lovely and cheat in a few ways. So it feels quicker and it is actually measurably quicker to get there. So what about where does that time go? So out of that you know, seven or nine seconds, where does that time go? And so if you look in the kernel log, you see somewhere between four and a half and 4.9 seconds in, we get to starting user space. So we get to this point of going, running in it as in it process. And you're like, well, that's a long time before we get to user space. What the hell is it doing? So I looked into it. And we spend about 2.5 seconds uncompressing our in a RAMFS, because we're storing this on Flash in firmware, right? So we want to use the least space as possible. Uh, so we have an XED compressed in at RAMFS. Uh, and our whole kernel and user space here is 16 megabytes, or less than 16 megabytes. And so a bunch of that 12 megabytes is a compressed in at RAMFS. And no matter what machine you run it on, my laptop or the bar servers we sell or anything, it seems to always take two and a half seconds. Um, and so one idea we have is to cut out that two and a half seconds is, wait, there's earlier phases of boot. What if we did the decompression beforehand while we were just, say, waiting for PCI devices to be discovered? Could we save that two and a half seconds? So we have a series of patches that uh, are written there that do do that, and we do save that two and a half seconds, uh, and that's fantastic. Uh, they're not currently upstream due to a bunch of really horrible, deep technical details about how we assemble firmware images. Uh, which is only something I'll talk about with copious amounts of alcohol. Um, but uh, we will get there soon, and we can shave a further two and a half seconds off. So that's kind of cool. And once we're down to that, we're like, you know, two and a half seconds for booting a kernel on the machine. Yeah, we can probably get that lower. We can probably get the user space quicker. That only takes a couple of seconds. But let's look at the whole boot time, right? We've made the Linux process really fast. Copied everyone else's work on how to make it quick, and we're going. I've got an improvement to cut off a couple of seconds. The total boot time for a Power 8 system, so that first one I showed that was slow and we never got to the end to, uh, was originally three plus minutes, right? From hit, clicking the button in the web UI to getting the ability to load your operating system, that was over three minutes. Um, we got that down to less than two minutes. And it's like, well, whole minute off boot time, that's pretty good, 33% without terrible effort, that's great. Power 9 were a bit slower for a bunch of reasons. Uh, usually we added features in various places that slowed things down, things like Secure boot takes some time when you're verifying firmware and you have to pin more pages in memory when you're cache contained, which means you then have to verify more signatures and have less memory to go things out. Uh, so there's all of those kind of things, right? We have uh, load more, we have to verify it. We have more code sitting in the little processor that starts your big processor, so that takes longer for it to load its firmware and start off and hand things off. Um, but it's obvious from this, if we think about that nine seconds, when you're talking about over two minutes, nine seconds is perhaps not where we should look for the next place to optimize, right? We're probably done in that layer. Uh, 
So this is what our firmware stack looks like. You've got that last bit. I've been talking about the Linux and Petty Boot level, which is the, hey, what do you want to boot kind of deal and detect some disks. For that, we have a piece of firmware called Ski Boot, which is where I primarily work. Uh, and it's small thing written in C. It's the boot, boot and runtime firmware, so it still sits around when Linux is running. For that, we have Host Boot, which turns your computer from a pile of transistors into something that resembles a computer. And before that, we have the self-boot engine, which is a microcontroller inside the CPU that makes one core be able to execute instructions out of cache. So it's the thing that goes, well, what we need is to poke some instructions into the, to the cache that will say how to load the rest of firmware, get the CPU set up so it can execute instructions, and hits go. So that's our boot process. So let's look one up. Remember, we're going backwards in time. Skiboot, what do we do here? Well. On a Power 8 open power system, we spend about 20 seconds there. Uh, and it used to take significantly longer. So in that very first iteration, it used to take close to a minute. And that was because we did things serially. And it turns out you have many CPU cores, so do things in parallel. And you know that worked. So what is taking time? Well, PCIe in the spec says you have to wait a certain amount of time to find if there's any cards there. It's like going, hello, is anyone there? OK, let's go. Right? There's that time that's built into the spec. So guaranteed, we're always going to spend a couple of seconds when you have PCI. Uh, that's sort of a minimal amount of time we could ever get to. And our original time, it took a long time because we went, hey, for each PHB, try and find things. And it turns out you could just do that at once. So we cut many seconds off of doing that way. Uh, we have many, many CPU threads. Like, you could have 22 cores a socket at four threads per core. That adds up to be a lot. So even without doing you know, task switching at all, you just run everything on different CPU threads, and it's fine. So PCIe now takes around three seconds of that boot time. So you might know that 20 minus 3 equals 17. Anyone not? Well, you learned something today. Uh, so where does that time go? Uh, and it turns out if you measure it, and that can include by either looking on more detailed log levels in firmware or adding some extra printfs in, because printf is the absolute supreme form of debugging, we can find out that all of this time goes to loading something called this. So that Linux and Petty Boot environment I was talking about, so that's a 16 megabyte compressed partition in Flash. Our Flash is partitioned up. Uh, and the kernel is XZ compressed, and the init RAMFS is XZ compressed. So that's probably about close to as small as we can go. Uh, and part of the job of Skiboot is to load that from Flash into memory somewhere and jump to it at the end. So how long does that take? So on our enterprise -y system, so that old one with the web UI thing there and you know, the hex codes and all that, that takes less than a second to load that 16 megabytes because it's an enterprise system that has a fast connection between the service processor where all the firmware is stored into the power CPU. So it can just splat it in memory really quick. But what about on our open power system. So the ones that you, know, you can buy now for you know, a thousand bucks a board kind of deal, or you know, ones that are in the top two supercomputers on the top 500, for example. Uh, what happens there? Well, to tell this story, we need to go back in time. Now, a feedback when I gave a draft of this talk in, in the company was, some people might not know an ISA bus is. And I believe I said, Marky, you're telling me I'm old. <laughs> So please, someone reassure me that someone knows what this is. Uh, so we had these slots, uh, those slots. And they're kind of still around in modern computers, like, and pretty much all of them. Uh, and it's called low pin count, because they basically took ISA and cut down the, the number of wires to four, and then quadrupled the clock speed, and added a few extra features. And that's it. Otherwise, it looks really, really similar. Uh, and the ideas are the same. So I haven't benchmarked loading our firmware from Flash from one of these things. But I suspect the performance is similar. Uh, so this is what uh, LPC looks like for doing firmware read cycles. right? So it's a 33 megahertz bus, and it's pretty chatty for reading data. So this is reading a single byte. In case you haven't done the math there, you can tell there's a lot of cycles there involved to read a single byte. So if you go 33 megahertz, you know, isn't many megahertz anymore, and you work out, oh, that can't be too fast, and you go, Oh, that's a lot of overhead. Is that, could that be better? And it's like, yeah, it turns out they thought of that and said, you know, there's this great 128 byte firmware read command. You're like, oh, if that was all overhead, you just pack in 128 bytes instead of one, then that'd be great. And you might notice a little word that says optional. 
but let's do, it. let's do the math. So for small reads here, you can say, OK, how many clocks? It's all this in the spec. It's a great spec from Intel. It's a ripping, cracking read if you need a book on the flight home. Uh, and you go, how are you going to do it here? And you're like, OK, here's total clocks, access time, bandwidth. Oh, megabytes per second, 1.75. OK. And for some reason, the math is missing on this slide and the thing there. But let's look at it there and think, 1.75, what does this mean? 16 megabytes divided by 1.75 megabytes per second in the optimal situation where you never have to wait for flash and there's nothing busy and you know our code is perfect and anything like that is 9.14 seconds. And you think, huh. So it turns out we're not quite ideal and we're about 12-ish something seconds or whatever. But you go, that's, that's the lower bound for reading that 16 meg. And if we looked at, well, what if we had this 128 byte read cycle when you go look at the other part and does the math for you because you know who wants to do math when you're trying to urgently write an LCA talk uh, and you could say wow if we had that we could go at 5.74 megabytes per second and you'd go oh that'd be great but it turns out that our hardware we have a limitation right so our service processor doesn't support this 128 byte per cycle read I know it because not only did they tell us it didn't support it I tried it and it didn't work uh, <laughs> Never believe any hardware documentation. Always try it. Um, and it was like, oh, damn. And it turns out that if we perhaps changed our system design to instead of having our system flash attached to the service processor you know, off the BMC and reading it through that, and we had it directly attached on the LPC bus, maybe we could get some flash chips that did support this and boot quicker. I believe some x86 systems do this, and they have a mux between who controls what. And we end up doing it this way because we have some extra features and other things that work and details, et cetera. But doing hardware changes there would actually improve boot time with a single line of code change to our firmware. Would cut that 9.5 seconds down by a lot. So what other buses do we have to the BMC to extract firmware over? Could we just read it over PCI? So the BMC is also connected to the host by a PCI. And this is why on servers you have a VGA port at the back. That's actually a PCI device in the BMC that's then exported to the host. So PCI for us comes up fairly late in boot. So it does come up in ski boot. Um, but to do data transfer over it is something that you would have to write more code for. And you know, that sounds like work. And you know, there's important beers to sample. So um, we could do that. But we also want to think, is this the best bang for buck doing it in this place? Will this solve everything? And let's look at the whole boot picture again. So we have 2 minutes 25 as our total system boot time. We have Linux and Petty Boot is now 9-ish seconds. And you're like, OK, cool. And then we have Ski Boot, we're now 20-ish seconds with reading that whole 16 meg stuff over there, which means the previous two phases of firmware, the SB and Host Boot, total about 1 minute and 50 seconds. So we should possibly look at what they're doing. Could we make them faster? And let's have a look. We spend around 1 minute and 7 seconds in Host Boot. Uh, and this is a bit of firmware that, among other things, brings up memory. So it starts the little controller that does thermal controls. It starts the little thing that you can use to then do deeper stop states inside the CPU cores. So it's the power management on the individual core. Uh, there's a little microcontroller that knows how to turn the core on and off, and you want to set that up correctly. So it needs some firmware and everything there. It sets that up. It trains memory and brings up DRAM and all of that. And this is the boot process on a two socket P9. So it's fairly quick. Now we're starting to train memory, and it comes back. But how does this work on big systems? Because let's go do a detour on crazy large systems. So host boot also runs on sort of the multi-draw giant enterprise many, many socket systems that you buy for you know, a whole bunch of money when you need a ton of memory and a ton of compute. Uh, and the way they boot is kind of interesting because you have a different SMP bus going between these drawers than you do between CPUs on a board. So you end up bringing up host boot on each drawer individually. So you have four instances of this bit of firmware at some point, And you get to the point where you train the links between the cabinets that have the extra processors. And then you just stitch everything together and convert from four separate computers running something that looks like an operating system to one computer now running an operating system with a lot more cores and memory and kind of freaky. But uh, that's really cool. But I won't talk deep to that just for like, this is how big machines do. So we should not break those machines because they turn out to make a whole bunch of money. And it would make that firmware team really cranky if they could no longer you know, do the rest of their job. So let's split it up. What does host boot take? So before we have DRAM up, so while we're running cache contain, it takes around 33 seconds. Uh, for 
you know, I say a relatively small machine with only 512 gig of RAM, uh, it takes about 10 seconds to init that. And it's like, well, that's pretty quick, 10 seconds, half a terabyte, go for it all. And post DRAM are about 25 seconds. So what is it doing? And remember how I was just talking about there's all that time reading th stuff from Flash? So let's look at the partition table for our Flash. So this is all the partitions in a firmware image uh, for a Witherspoon system. And they all got names and offsets and flags and all that kind of jazz. Uh, but the ones that host boot will read during a normal boot, so just doing an error-free normal boot, are these, which is really hard to see in red and you don't really need to care, apart from the fact that if you add up all the numbers, it's roughly 32 megabytes. So let's do some math. 32 megabytes divided by 1.75 megabytes per second equals 18 seconds. So this is in the best case, right? We're not waiting for flash. Everything's running perfectly, and we're, we're going really quick. So there's at least 18 seconds of that one minute and seven that is, by definition of the hardware, going to be spent reading things off. And one of the odd things about that bit of firmware is it does on-demand paging. So it basically sets up the MMU and will page things in and out from Flash because running cache contained is you now have like a small computer, uh, megabytes of memory kind of deal. Uh, and that memory is pretty tight. So you could just page out some of your code and do that and not have too many firmware authors worry about code size as much. And it's also as a way to make the computer boot at all versus really quick, right? Premature optimization, evil. So we have the odd thing of there is thrashing before there's memory. So we have swap before there is RAM. <laughs> so how do we peek into what's going on, right? We want to know, OK, so it's probably doing this. And it's probably reading a lot of that. But is it reading it optimally? What's going on? And you could do this by trying to put printfs into host boot, right? But remember how I said it adds time to boot time when you print out too many things? Because quiet saved 18 seconds. And so you're like, oh, well, that's it. That would be annoying to print it all out. And then you'd have to parse it, and it would be annoying. Or you could like put it in memory somewhere and copy it out, but you don't yet have memory. So you know, that's a bit annoying. Uh, and you don't want to alter the boot process. You want to know what's actually happening when you really boot the computer. And you go, what, you, what would you do in Linux? Block trace. There's this lovely kernel feature where you say, please trace everything that's happening to the block device all through the I.O. layer. And you get wonderful, pretty graphs and movies about what all blocks have been read and written and when it was queued and all kind of fancy things. And you're like, geez, that'd be good for firmware. So I wrote it. Um, so we read firmware from Flash via a daemon on the BMC. So we might be reading it over that LPC bus, but there's a little piece of software there that marshals what's in an LPC window to be able to read. So a bit of modification on that bit of software on the other side, for example, saying, uh, we can only show you a 4K page at a time, so you're going to have to ask for a new one, which slowed down boot, but we got a very accurate representation of what pages were being read, because host boot runs with 4K pages, even though I know Linux will run on a hardware with 64K pages, 4K is good when you've got memory constrained systems like running cache contained. So what do we do? Let's have a look. This is a whole boot of a system of all the reads and writes to flash of while you're booting. And so you can see a few big things there. I tried to label it a bit in what you're getting. So the boot kernel bit at the end, a large linear read from flash. We read the NVRAM stuff of any variables there. That's sort of some runtime firmware and, uh, and ski boot that's being read out. So that's firmware, that's some other data we need to read. That's another bit of firmware for the on-chip controller that does thermal stuff. Uh, and we've got this big sort of scattery something here which looks oddly like a whole bunch of paging going on and by looking along the lines there you go, huh, some of those things are being read more than once. And so we look at the whole stats of that block trace and it's like, well, there's 50 megabytes of total I.O. which means that from the roughly the 32, 35 megabytes of flash that we need to read in total, we're actually doing about 15 megabytes of I.O. extra than our bare essential which, if you do the math, is about eight and a half seconds. So we spend about eight and a half seconds purely thrashing swap while booting. That doesn't sound ideal. So how do you fix that? How do you fix make everything smaller? Well, you'd think GCC-OS would be like step one, like ask the compiler to make things smaller. And it turns out that's hard. Uh, and this is because for reasons that no one can remember, Hostboot uses a custom linker. 
that just doesn't happen to deal with all the possible relocations that GCC can emit, and we've survived for the past six years out of dumb luck. As, as our toolchain guys put it when I asked. Um, so first of all, we should possibly not have a custom linker, and we're like, let's, let's skin this cat properly uh, and do it, you know, skin first. I don't, uh, don't actually know how to skin a cat. Like, but let's go and try and fix that first. So we want to try and fix that to be able to then have dash OS, and that should probably buy us a whole bunch of boot time essentially for free. Uh, but there's also another area of boot that's annoying. But that's pretty good motivation. If you get that and we could get things a whole bunch quicker, we could save like multiple seconds from boot without having to change like really any of the core code. So that sounds great. Make the compiler do it. So the strong motivation. So the SBE, so that self-boot engines, that little microcontroller inside the CPU that starts up the one CPU core to get your firmware going. So that thing uh, has been described as a 20 second black hole. Um, and that's due to a bunch of reasons. Uh, some of our initialization had to move into the SBA from host boot, so it had to go earlier for reasons that when you ask, you know, one of the developers who's more closely involved, you go, why did that? And you know the reaction you get when you ask, hey, why is that? And you get the, which means, you know, don't ask. <laughs> so there's some of that. Uh, and it is, it is slower than P8, and part of that is also adding in features, right? The SBA does a lot more than it did in P8. It's because we've got Secure boot for firmware, it ends up being at runtime, sort of a marshalling entity to make sure that you can't go through debug interfaces and get access to things you can't, uh, a whole bunch of that stuff. So we've got that to tackle as well. But we have a good idea on how to tackle that host boot problem and get a whole bunch of seconds back. We also have the idea that there is various bits of hardware in host boot that's in it, initialized in serial. We can probably do that in parallel. Uh, there's a couple of other things that we could do by simply applying XZ compression to the partition, because we have these big linear reads, so we can use that trick as well. So we probably reckon we can cut 10 to 20 seconds off in the next year on that. Uh, SBE, not sure, we haven't looked too closely on it yet. But one question I asked was like, how long do other computers take? Like, you just said this hell-bent focus on like our computers. Um, and it turns out we're in the ballpark for servers. Uh, I was talking about this to some people in an Open Power Foundation meeting. And one of the guys was like, you, you realize you're from a very large company. He says, you realize you're faster than literally all of our other servers to boot. And I was like, Shh, shut up. I want to make them quicker. <laughs> I was like, oh, cool. But like, and one of the issues is we have machines now that are going to be used like on the desktop again or as workstation. So if you bug huge, have a look at the Blackbird board, micro ITX board, Power9 CPU, couple of sockets, really cool. Because you should definitely have a desktop that has an entirely open source firmware stack like no binary blobs. And we have a boff in this room after this talk, so you should come along and see it. And so why do people care about sort of booting faster and doing things that appear to boot faster? And part of them is this. I don't know why it's a VGA tree or something somewhere in the world, but you know, there is. Uh, and if we take a long time to boot to the point where we can get sort of video out the side, you end up with the user experience for a desktop of is you press a button and then it goes beep, starts whirring, and then two minutes, two minutes later, your monitor turns on. You might be wondering for two minutes what the hell's going on, right? People kind of like to get some feedback. So we solve the boot process feedback on our machines now with the BMC by basically having a daemon on the BMC that reads the serial port and puts that into the video buffer before Linux boots and takes over that, which works fine, but doesn't work when you have a, something that isn't VGA, but is rather a discrete graphics card. So when you have a discrete graphics card, it's not connected to the BMC at all, that you have an AMD card in there because an open source driver stack means you can use it on PowerPC. Uh, so you're like, well, I need to get that graphics card up. And turns out graphics drivers are really simple. <laughs> and we don't want to write them really early in firmware, right? So we want boot progress on a discrete graphics card. Uh, so this is you know, desktop running on a Power9 system, which is kind of cool. So you don't want two minutes of blank time. On a desktop PC, like, you know, PCIe needs to be probed even, so you've already got seconds before you're going to find the graphics you know, information on there. Uh, and you, know, you might think, oh, that happens pretty quickly when I power on the computer. And it's like, I was timing some desktop computers and asking other people. It's like, no, actually, modern machines take quite a while for the screen to come on. Like, we've got a decent number of seconds in there before the screen comes on at all. So you know, maybe, maybe we're OK to delay doing these a little bit. <laughs> 
Uh, and these definitely aren't as easy to drive as a frame buffer, so that's a bit annoying. We don't have VGA BIOS because you know we don't have legacy uh, PC stuff in there, which makes it a little bit harder. And could we even drive those while cache contained? Like before we have DRAM up, could we even bring PCI up enough to then talk to the card and then figure out how we write a driver for these things in you know mere megabytes of memory? Turns out that someone asked the hardware engineers, "Of like, could we bring PCI up while still cache contained?" And they went. <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> so I believe that's probably not a verified bit of hardware and probably would be an adventurous uh, thing to go and try. Uh, but what could we do to make things better in some situations? Uh, you know, if we can't sort of necessarily do that quicker and that's not going to be a short-term thing, uh, is there any way we could cheat? And it turns out we can. So one of the problems here I've been talking about is booting a computer. What's the other thing you do? Reboot, did I hear? <laughs> so we have a, a, a feature we call fast reboot, which is basically the whole idea of going, well, we don't necessarily need to reinitialize all of the hardware when you reboot. Could we get a minimal set of hardware we could reinitialize when you say reboot that will get back up into Linux again and into our bootloader reliably enough and figure out when it's not going to be reliable? Uh, and do it that way. It's like, yes, we can, and it now takes seconds to reboot. So we are like orders of magnitude faster rebooting than we are booting. And I can do over a thousand boots in 23 hours now. So that's you know pretty good for f reboot uh, rather than boot. Uh, so we do ship this. It is on some machines, not all of them, because it depends on what hardware you have enabled and if we have code to do it in firmware. But you know, reboot quickly. That's a machine rebooting and running a hardware exerciser. So, you know, you've just watched how fast fast reboot can be and booting an OS and starting a whole bunch of stuff. But it's not useful of cold booting. So we can solve the problem for rebooting. There's also the argument this is a bit of cheating, as in, you know, sometimes when you say reboot, you do mean actually reboot and do it properly because something's gone terribly wrong. So there's an argument to be made there. So I've been looking at other systems and what they do and trying to infer what goes on on a boot, cold boot versus a reboot. And it seems to be that other people do similar-ish cheating, but just take longer around it. So I'm not terribly concerned there. But it would be nice if we had the whole boot process be faster rather than relying on sort of arguably cheating for reboot. But it's a good feature that does solve it. So where did we go? We had P9 were better than P8, even though we went backwards in some areas, right? Our GA1, our first release for P8, took well over three minutes. And our first release for P9 took you know, two minutes 25, which was slower than what we got P8 too, but that was several years of development and optimization, right? Uh, so we got better, release on release. Uh, we have a good track record in optimizing the simple components, like Linux and the user space bits. We did that. Uh, we need to delve into the hairy bits, so some of the depths of host boot and like some legacy code there. We do need to delve into that more. And we have been doing some sort of planning on where we can fit this into development time and, and get things going. Uh, we can get good measurements and act on data rather than guesses. And that was a big thing of why I did the, hey, let's see if we can get something that's like block trace for doing Flash, uh, was let's prove it. Like, we have these theories of what's going on. And we should prove it and act on real data, not just guesswork. Right? So we've got good measurements. Uh, we have a good idea of what we can attack, like individual things that different people can do at various times. And we're faster than compu some competing machines. So that's a good place to start from. And whenever someone raises that point, I'm like, I have no problem with not only being a fast computer, but being the one to boot quicker than anyone else. It's like, here's the demo of the machine you might want to buy. And it's up running and booting an OS, and it's installed already before the other one's even turned on. Sounds fantastic. Like, sounds fantastic. No problem with that. So where can we find code? Code is up on GitHub. So you can get all the source code to our firmware on GitHub Open Power. Uh, if you don't have a machine that has that, then you should reconsider your life choices <laughs> and wonder why there's not firmware there. So thank you. We have uh, photo credits and movie credits for things there, and Open Power Boff here in minutes. And there's probably some time for some questions. <laughs> Just on the decompression, is it the reading the disk or the decompression that takes ages? Uh, 
So the reading the disk takes the 12 seconds, and then decompressing the init ramifest takes two and a half. And is that parallelizable, or is it already parallelized and it still sucks? So we're thinking of parallelizing the decompression by putting it earlier in boot. So doing it like while we're detecting PCIe devices, for example, we decompress it. Or we do it so that we read the init ramifest before we read the kernel. So while we're reading the kernel, which will take about you know, two seconds to read, we can decompress the init ramifest. So we're thinking of sort of switching up that way. And it's sort of doing it that way and being able to compile sort of a firmware image without constantly changing partition signs manually in three different XML files and four Perl scripts. Um, that is sort of the way of to get that build reliably out there. So we, we can do it. So the prototype there does work. And like on the enterprise machines, cuts two and a half seconds off like straight away. And that's what you should get like interned to do. <laughs> It's like, here, run with this. <laughs> and they did, which is great. Cool. Um, thanks very much over here. Ah! <laughs> um, that's really great work. Um, I'm not familiar with this sort of deep, deep hardware stuff, but it seems like a lot of the stuff that you're relying on or you know, waiting to initialize needs RAM why not start why not start ram and ram is relatively like you know getting 512 gigabytes of ram initialized takes 10 seconds so why not do that earlier that's a good i know just laughter here yeah so. like you know why not do ram earlier that's a good question so the ipl flow as it's called is an initial program load because we're ibm and have terms that predate everyone else joining the industry let alone being there so the boot process right has been sort of architected as you know, sitting down with hardware engineers and going, you know, do this one, two, three, four, five, six, up, and then 6.1, 6.2, up to 21.3, and then there's the other bits of boot. But, and that's been one of the things we could go back and look on. So like, here's the verified thing that everyone thinks would work, and the question is, could we rearrange that a bit to make things better? And we haven't had that discussion yet, um, and perhaps that's something we should have for sort of, like, we could do it maybe on existing processors, or we could talk about it for the next generation ones, uh, for I don't know if I'm allowed to say what any future processes could be called, but you know, there's been power, power two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So we've got no idea what the next one could be called. Uh, <laughs> uh, but you know, we could look at that and maybe have the discussion there of going, hey guys, could we make sure that this bit of hardware would work earlier so we could get this up and improve boot time as well as having everyone writing firmware a whole bunch of less headaches because as a minute you start running out of memory like cache contained, people start you know, weeping and crying and having a terrible day. Like, yeah. It's a good question if it's firmware or hardware. So that's, that's something we need to work out. And if it's hardware, then we should talk to the hardware people, because it turns out they work in a company called IBM as well, and we're allowed to send them things that resemble email. <laughs> Hey, Stuart, um, how much of this is architecture, at least hardware agnostic? Are there any other benefits that you're pushing back in that will benefit traditional x86, hardware bootstrap that the ARM community can leverage, or is like the majority of this effort very much focused around what you're doing in the open power space? So periodically we get questions of like, hey, why don't you use like UEFI and call boot and stuff? And so we've tried to delve in and like, well, one of the things is that no one, everyone holds UEFI and it doesn't bring them joy, uh, which is the fashionable thing to do currently. Um, and you look at like, what's the components of Core Boot in there? And pretty much what we'd get from that that I can work out is like, we'd get someone else's like limited libc. And that doesn't bring us a whole bunch of over what we already have over the current code base. So it's a bit hard to say whether sort of coming to anything more common that would be shared across platforms would really help because so much of that time is spent on very chip specific operations. Like this is, these are the exact registers to poke with these values because that register is at that address because here's the physical layout of the chip and it's these values because they worked out those are the ones that are work when you manufacture the thing because transistors and physics. Uh, and you have a lot of that going on uh, that becomes yeah, you know, in firmware because we'd never want to push that into the kernel, and that's sort of our line of like, well, you know, we should never have the kernel looking at processor internal registers uh, that are not architected, uh, and most of our firmware time is spent on stuff that is more power specific and isn't really translatable across. The stuff that is is all the Linux work, 
So for things like can we make build root boot faster and emit images in ways that boot a build root image faster, and that's what we look at. So we can poke the IO team and go, you should really make that RAID driver like work quicker um, and you know work cleanly across KExec, for example. And we do that, so we get a lot of sort of KExec bug fixes <laughs> in because that's how we boot an OS. Um, and we want that for KDump anyway, so it's sort of you know, deduplication work. So there's little bits, but a lot of it is power specific. Yeah, and going to anywhere where it might not be is questionable return of investment. And why maintain UEFI when you could just maintain Linux and make everyone's life better? Hi. So you mentioned um, maybe connecting the flash more directly to the CPU in the future. I assume you've already given that as feedback to the hardware team for you know future iterations. Have you considered asking for more flash so you don't need to compress anything? So yeah, to ask for more flash to not have to compress it means that we have to read more megabytes from flash, which could take longer. So it's kind of one of those weird trade-offs. One of the things we could look at is could we do like a squash FS and like page it in on demand for that stuff? Uh, but then you have an issue with secure boot is really easy when you're like, here is a one file that you sign, right? Here's a partition on flash, you sign this, you load it, you verify the signature. When you're doing about now a squash FS thing, you now need to go, oh, we have to be able to verify individual blocks or read the whole thing in advance anyway. And that becomes a thing that you have to think really hard about. Um, so we could, there's pressure like you could get bigger flash chips, um, but that also adds cost. So we're already like pretty large on flash chip size. We're like typically 64 meg or 128 meg. And that's quite large for system firmware chips. Um, like we could get more. Uh, some of the enterprise boxes are talking about much larger things because they want more features that will use disk space. Um, but it's a balancing act. And also like you don't want to ever use a bus that's too complex to bring up. Like LPC is great because it just works, right? Sufficiently slow. Well, really well known that it just works. You don't need complex training or a magical setup, right? It's really simple hardware, and that's why we use it, and that's why other people use it. There's other generation buses, but there's other complications for that. So it's one of that discussion of what you can reasonably get, you know, all the legal things in line to be able to implement what you can do that's the least amount of effort versus spending your time doing other things, and it's all of that complex negotiation of where the effort goes. And sometimes it's just down to, um, I don't want to do that real work this week. I'm going to go and look at that. Uh, <laughs> Do we have any more? Are we out of time? We are out of time. So stay here for the boff if you want. Go look at like Hugh's board because it's cool. I actually have a Power9 like die as well if you want to see the bare CPU and you can point out, oh, there's the CPU core. It's kind of neat. So stick around and thank you. We